Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. So it has been a long time since I've been in person at one of these two. So this is a little bit almost fresh for me. Um, so I hope that this talk is uh, informative, uh, uh, that you in, in enjoy some of the content. Um, please, you know, let me know, stop me in the midst of whatever I'm speaking about. If something is not quite uh, being expressed the way you thought, or, or maybe even if I interpret something wrong, this is an evolving space. We can always improve uh, upon our own knowledge together. So uh, with that, um, Caveats here are that this is uh, a presentation I prepared this week, but I haven't really had the chance to really practice it. So you're gonna be my first audience. So hopefully it's gonna go well. All right, so thank you all again. Uh, I'm Kevin Hartman. Uh, I work at a company called Unified Consulting. I'm a practice director there. I oversee data science and machine learning engineering. Uh, I help a lot of our clients uh, enabling data science activities that also extends into, includes, um, you know, data platform work uh, and you know, to support data science work. Uh, and that also uh, shoots into ML ops. So really happy to be here and to be invited to talk about this topic. So a lot of my clients also like, like come to, to try to understand like what it is that you know, ML ops means. What is the, like, why, why do we need ML ops? So, so why do we need ML ops? So I, I started thinking about like, how do we describe this in terms of uh, Mary Andretti? fabulous, famous race car legend. And so how does, what does this relate to with machine learning? What do those things have in, in common, right? Well, I'm gonna answer that question for you. So, oh my goodness, my, it's, 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 I didn't know it was gonna fade in. So you can optimize their performance with the right people, process, and tools. So for Mario Andretti, he's got a pit crew, fabulous pit crew that helps him operate um, his equipment the most efficiently. Uh, he's got um, a race, and that, that's the people. And, the, and the, he's got a race car, car, car itself, which is just optimized with all sorts of instruments, uh, tools, um, you know, fancy gadgets, right, to really optimize his performance that way. And he also operates on a race car track, race car track. That's the process, right? So you can optimize the performance with those right, right ingredients and you know, lots of track time, like following that process routinely. So in ML apps, we have something similar. So ML ops is how we can get Mario Andretti like performance uh, from operational ML. It includes people, process, and tools. The people though on this side are your typical sort of you know folks that you would expect to see. ML engineers, data engineers, data scientists, ML slash DevOps engineers. Those are the, the, the types of roles that we need, the ingredients for successful ML ops implementations. Then there's the process. You can almost see this is almost like a race course too, right? I mean, you're having to follow and navigate uh, within those different disciplines, different parts of, of implementing and enabling uh, data science models and then putting them into production, right? And this is an iterative process. You're, you sometimes spend some times in the cycles uh, above in the first forefront, preparing, analyzing, and iterating on that. There's a lot of iteration in the middle uh, and then finally productionizing, which could then come back into uh, back in your research if you have model errors, or if you're automating that, you might you might be able to uh, kick off an automation process that would a, a lot, enable automated retraining. Lots and lots of tools too. So we've got people, process, tools, and this data scientist data scientists here. Lots mostly, ML engineers, both. Who 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 can tell me what the difference is between a ML engineer and a data scientist? Uh, that's arm wrestle. <laughs> All right, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. Okay. Okay, so ML ops. Uh, however, I said people process tools. It's not just that. It's also a mindset. It's also these activities, the way that people operate and work together. You have to sort of subscribe to this belief, right, of, of what, you're, what we're doing in this ecosystem. And it's akin to the way that Agile has formed around how we got in, so in the software side. So I have a software background. And in looking at how DevOps evolved, right? It's to support continuous integration, continuous deployment. ML is going into the same route, same pathway. All right, any questions so far? Cool. Okay, so what I do when I'm engaging clients is I, I go through this sort of high level, like, well, what does this sort of mean for, for the team? And how do these each one of these 
section sort of, you know, what do they look like inside of those processes? And I, and I almost like, you know, recommend that, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be different for each sort of environment, each circumstance, but in general, those, these are sort of the main concerns. And then these are the things you would do within those concerns, right? Um, and does this sort of land or resonate as to how you guys might view your work? And also, where, where do you tend to, to slot in? Do you slot in sort of across the board or more up front? Our data engineers will be more up front, data scientists more in the middle, operationalization upper, upper more at the tail end. Sort of see yourself in this mix, this picture, anywhere or across the whole, the whole landscape. Sort of in this, I saw that. I was like right in the middle, somewhat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it takes a team. It takes people putting on different roles. So you need to sort of you know define that in the relationship too. It's helpful to have something down almost on paper, or I use Miro here, right, to describe like even starting in the initiation of such a thing. What are the things we're going to do when we're operating you know, with stakeholders or with customers? What are the things we want to get out before we start a project? And then even going into the project, I've done this um, sort of in Miro as well, having an understanding who's sort of, it feels like a racy diagram. This is sort of a racy for, um, for ML ops, like who's doing what. Um, and, and also, of course, in, in, in here's the when. But the lead person here is, is the data engineer working with the data scientist and an ML engineer. And then they have a number of activities. I'm sorry, there's a little bit cut out, but this is actually only a, a snapshot too. And you know, I recommend you guys you know, do this for your own environments too, just to have clear definitions as to, as to who's operating on what role. I'm gonna to get to the roles in a little bit, but first a landscape of the tech stack, right? Um, so this is, this can get, Pretty complicated, um, but in general, you know, when we try to look at a data pipeline and a data platform, you know, we're typically when, when you talk to different, you know, uh, CXO groups, right? They typically think of the first lane there. I'm feeding into a data warehouse system, and I'm doing transformations along the way to get there. But for data science, we don't do that. We I mean, we typically don't do that. You can. But usually it's too far gone. It's, it's been prepared and it's in first normal form. It's, you know, it's, it's aggregated, you've got, uh, it's great for human consumption, but it's not the best if you're trying to do data science modeling, especially if you want to operationalize that and have it work off of that pipeline in real time. So what do we do there? Well, you, you kind of need to operate off of a lake. It's a lake first sort of approach, or even now it's called, a, you can kind of get into a lake house. That, that also works. But, Feeding off of, of, of a lake house or data lakes is the first sort of step in making sure you have uh, adequate data for analysis, experimentation, going through these various phases, right? You can kind of see, well, well what we're doing experimentation, we're going to have a model eventually. We may uh, then decide, oh, it's ready for production. We're going to operationalize that, getting it ready for CICD. We, we might have opportunities to take features and say, hey, we're going to actually promote these and have these available and put them into the pipeline too, so that when I want to run inference, I'm ready to go, right? And then we're deploying and you know, having a packaging mechanism uh, and then ev eventually like even modern models in production, right? This is sort of a full on picture at a high level. So let's kind of get to the, who's doing what? Um, these are the people, these are, who, these, these are the people who are doing that. So what do you think about this? Of course they can overlap, but I'm gonna get, I was gonna get to this, you took the wind out of my sails here. I, they're, they're, these people, these are roles, right? I think what some of the confusion, especially in the marketplace and as in people too, is that you say you're doing this thing or you wanna be this title, but really these are roles. Like I. I I can do, maybe I can do all of this, right? But what am I called? Well, okay, uh, a unicorn, right? That's what I'm called, right? But, but when I'm doing that specific function, right? I'm performing the role of the data engineer, right? I might not be a data engineer permanently, but I'm doing that work. I'm operating in that sort of zone. And, and that's really what I think we need 
to do as a community is to, to tease that out and to explain and, and say that we're people and we could take on these roles. And this is typically what it means when we go in and do those things in those roles. Typically, right? There's going to be some overlap. I had a problem with this one, right? Who's doing feature? Who's creating features? <laughs> well, data scientists can. Um, data engineers can. Um, machine learning engineers can. Um, who's going to operationalize it? Um, if I'm a full stack data scientist, I can kind of get all that need, all I need to do to make um, my pipeline run and have it auto trained or something like that. Might be too advanced for me though. I might I might want to stick to my my bones and just perform research, right? So that this is such a, a big field and, and having and being able to do everything. Um, I mean, it's a treat, right? It's fun. But uh, when you get to an enterprise level, you can't do everything yourself, right? And that's what I consult and advise on is when you get to that level, you kind of need to break things down. Any questions there? How does this look? Yeah, question. I think it's sort of like where you're starting out from too. Like, like maybe just starting out, it's be awesome to have a unicorn because then that's all you need. Um, but it doesn't scale. Like I'm busy in my days. I'm like hyper busy nowadays. <laughs> like it doesn't scale. So you need to sort of have other people who specialize. Mm -hmm. That's my experience. Uh, although that's not exactly always fun, right? It's fun to do it all really is. Okay. How am I doing on time, by the way? Yeah. Oh. Quick, uh, quick question about the pipeline at the top there. So uh, the data that goes into the data scientist block is going after just storing, but the curating and streaming is not part of that. Why, why would you think that? Like, wh why would you say yeah, that? It's a great question. Well, curation data streaming, goes I know you're, you, you, you zoned in on something where I took a little bit of a liberty of just trying to like put streaming somewhere um it's not really in order <laughs> it, 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 you're right but i i don't i don't typically want to go after curating if i'm doing data science work um it's been too far mush, pushed along i might go for like silver like process if you're familiar sort of the like there's bronze and there's silver and there's gold um and silver is kind of where data has been cleaned like at least um but some Data science friends, they don't want that. They want to go for raw. They don't trust necessarily how it's been cleaned. Right. And that's actually probably true for like anomaly detection. You don't necessarily want to get to clean data. You're actually wanting the dirty data. That's where the that's where the nuggets are. Right. All right, cool. I'm I'm so you I'm testing this out on you guys. That's how I'm trying to see the world. 15? Okay. All right. So uh, you're asked the question about who does what. Uh, that's the, the part of this talk is is who doing what, and in general, right? We're we're trying to think of these people as 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 roles, right? They, or these are roles, not necessarily people. I can do them all, but just sort of recognize and realize that when I put this, I'm doing this function, I'm operating as uh, you know this type of of, of persona. Um, I don't want to read them all, but in general, I think the biggest sort of place where you can see the differences potentially I, you can argue with me and say that I, that's not all I do as an ML engineer, but in general, sort of the division of labor are, are kind of there. Do, would you agree with that with the way that this is? And even ML ops engineer is a little bit off. It's an offshoot too. Too distributed, distributed enough. Okay. We can we can talk later if you. Oh yeah. Oh, and there we go. Engineers uh, gonna... What's the difference between data scientist and model owner? Model owner, um, great question. So, the model owner is, I would call that person, the data science manager, right? The person who is probably accountable for all folks on the team and ensuring that the business you know gets the right model that they need and informs them of you know things like hey this model's drifting or you know or we need a new model or you know but working with, with the business that we have and and i'll get to this too but that's something you kind of 
would evolve to later, right? You don't you don't have one right away. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, I don't want to blame you to put test in there. So tests are tests. Yeah. I agree. But what about the code testing? Does data scientists need to test their code? Because I won't let his their code to go in yeah. production if they don't test their code. Yeah. So, I mean, you might say data scientist doesn't and lets the Malma engineer do it. Yeah. So I would love to do to say everyone should unit test. I have a software background, so you're gonna like say you know, I'm gonna say that, right? Um, but that's not always the case. And again, when you're doing research experimentation, you don't necessarily think about those things. Not to say you shouldn't, but you don't. Right. Okay. Yes, yes. I, I think I do want to get to a couple of things here about um, so I talk about who does what, and now I want to just talk a little bit about the when. And, and when, when people are actually brought on into an organization, depends on the maturity level, where you're at in this sort of whole evolution. You know, at first, you're not actually even using MLOps, right? And, we'll, and I call this, I probably should call it zero, but it's, it's like sort of level one. And in this case, I'm not, I don't have all that sophistication yet. And, and I'm just trying things out. Um, I might be doing exploratory analysis and experimentation. It's a little POC work. I might be scoring a data set. That's level one, maturity level one. Two is when I start to take and do real models, not POCs, but real models, and I am now deploying them for integration. So I'm going to feed into applications that would rely on um, me serving up these models. And I might have some pipeline process automated at this point, too. That's level two. Level three is now where I'm introducing traceability, repeatability, and automation. Um, traceability, I, I, I actually have disciplines around managing my code and, and versioning that, models too. And I can repeat anything that I want. My artifacts can be recreated right, based on all this information. And I have automation, uh, CICD, oper I say operationalization. Thank you. Um, that's, that's included. Level four is now I'm actually scaling things out. All of my pipelines are completely automated. I can independently scale them. Um, I can also facilitate uh, model monitoring and retraining events. Um, I, I have feature stores. I can actually now start to think about doing active feedback and you know reinforcement learning and things like that. Those are the four stages. The when part of who is when, what, who does what and when. If you're only, if you're really it's just starting out and you know with a handful of POCs, you're kind of the core ingredients there are a data scientists and a data engineer. That's level one. When you start to do more than that and you're actually pushing out real models, you definitely need a DevOps engineer. You probably have a business owner who had some real you know, business problem that they needed to investigate and have made available. Um, level three is when you're having dozens of models, dozens and dozens. Um, you have to start thinking about what your ecosystem is going to look like now. And that involves you know, involving a, an ML architect to design more of that ecosystem with an ML engineers as well, testing and validating. Level four is when the model owner uh, comes into play, right? Hundreds of models. Um, you also would want to swap out that DevOps engineer for an ML ops engineer. Um, and then potentially have you know, analytics engineers so that they can incorporate the features that you might have developed in your feature store. Those could be interesting things you might want to push along into your data warehouse too, right? Okay, so those are the, those are the when part. Um, I actually, uh, before this talk, I, I uh, had a, uh, a conversation with Chip Hoyt. Do you know who Chip is? Yeah, she's really cool. Yeah, you do. Um, so she's working on a product and it's something that's still under wraps, but I told her I was doing this talk and we actually talked about this. And, and like, well, for the level one, couldn't that be just some ML engineer? That you might have, you're probably gonna ask that question too, right? Couldn't that be that? And yes, it can. I mean, you're kind of looking at the ML engineer as being someone that can really fulfill these two functions plus that function if you're kind of looking at that sort of unicorn. You can unicornish person. I, 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 I do. I think think we are doing a little bit of disservice in our industry when we don't say specifically that an ML engineer does these things too. And I, I want to get sort of get to like the, the going back to the full circle here, right? So what? Who does what? 
you know, data engineers typically focus on the, on the front end. I'm putting that hat on. Uh, data scientists do experiment tracking and model training. Uh, MLOps engineers are deploying those models to production, um, monitoring for drift, kicking off retraining events. And then ML engineers, they're operationalizing and packaging those models for CICD, implementing some maybe championing challenger testing, optimizing code, featureizing, and then also, you know, kind of all of the above. They kind of have to understand the full, the full spectrum, right? They should be able to be versed enough to go into all of those different elements and advise, uh, maybe even do. Um, and it's 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 a really interesting profession, right? Like, I think it's really cool um, because it's it does cross concern so much. Um, but you know, going back. I think, you know, it, defining like this part of it is probably the core to what we should say we do on top of everything else. Any, any, any questions or any disagreements on that? Yeah. My, my questions on the last slide, actually. Okay. Actually, so we're done with the slides. That was it. And then it was just uh, me and connect with me if you like. Um, Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Please. Yeah. So, uh, what do you think that you can kind of outsource? You know, some of the roles to manage services like AWS SageMaker, Azure Machine Learning, as a way to kind of shortcut your way to maturity, or is that kind of like a short-term, local optimal thing that will block you from Ooh, yeah, achieving you totally, true matur maturity? You can totally shortcut this. You can totally shortcut this by saying, you know what, I'm going to bring in. Um, Data IQ or H two AI or or Data Robot, right? And 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 not do any of those things um, myself, because they take care. They actually do build an ecosystem around a lot of this. They they'll actually even do data scrubbing for you, and they'll they'll. It's almost like no code environments. So yes, but is that the path to operationalizing them and having something that is uh, managing your um, you know, your circuits on a relay on an electric grid or whatever, like, is that, is that the place for that? I don't, I don't think so. Right. Uh, ex uh, exploring those data IQ, Azure machine learning stage, maker or Vitex AI, I can tell it involves um, extra learning for curve for everyone, because you want to tell your you want to show your data scientists where your model goes, where they should do it. So extra things um, comes also, the licensing cost as well. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, so I think if I am an ML engineer, I would build the whole thing myself. Yeah. And, and to be fair, like those package, those those um, low code um, tools, they they do allow you to run um, models in a container. They basically package up all the libraries and they containerize them, and then you can basically take them as Docker container, put them on a chaos or whatever Kubernetes cluster, and have it spit up. So so you can. Do you do that, but you're still relying on their on how you trained in their environment. You you lost that. You're not you have to still use their environment to, to 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 tune or train or retrain. And that's what makes things difficult where if you're trying to externalize that, and then you say, Oh, I want to do some um automated events where I want to kick off a retraining. Well, now you have to involve the package to do that or the, the, the platform. So it's not impossible, but it's it's really kind of where you are. I would say going back at that stairs. Up, you could actually start on a platform. Um, I, I went to the Gartner conference a couple weeks ago, and for the first time ever, they're splitting their sort of magic quadrant thing into two parts. And the first part of it is basically, um, you know, catering to the tooling of the data science community, like, like people who um, may have you know, gone to uh, you know a, a, a curriculum and, and had training on that. And then the other side of it is more of the low code, no code environment for citizen data scientists. And they, they're actually splitting that up because mm -hmm. things are divergent and you just have different needs. They're, they're not, it's not that they're wrong. They could work out. It's just depending on the use case and how mm -hmm. you treat your, your ML. Is it IP that you want to hold or is it, you know, are you still experimenting? Cool. Those are good questions. Anything, any, any other questions? Like, 
I want to just put the plug in for these three bucks. I love them. So, Kevin, so we went we went through the um, the maturity levels one, two, three, and four, defining the current states of companies. What does the future look like for MLOps? Do you do you imagine like certain roles merging and certain people doing certain things? Yeah, um, it's a great question. I think. I think what's you know what some tooling is coming up with. So even with with Databricks, they are also enabling auto ML type of features so that you can have a lot of that work, that exploration, which algorithm is going to work properly, can be automated. Um, and then you have sort of a, a leaderboard, and you can track all the experiments and sort of look at them. And you still have the code, which is kind of nice. You can also go into the code and change things. Um, I think the tooling is going to advance where some of the selections that are out of the box are going to be more enabling, but there's still going to be a lot of thought work that's required around some of the more not so common use cases. So there's I, I, the profession is not going away, in my opinion. Um, I just think it, that it's going to make things a little easier so we don't have to worry about you know, um, you know, doing a, a, a Bayesian approach, like, like things that are sort of we've done and add, add infinitum, let's not do, keep doing them. Let's do, let's do something more innovative or a little more uh, uh, yeah, interesting. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. So, uh, my question is this this whole pipeline that we discussed and the levels of maturity, is it applicable for all types of machine learning uh, uh, as, as an umbrella term or do you see any differences coming up based on, let's say, uh, type of machine learning that we're talking about, let's say unsupervised versus supervised versus reinforcement where you touched upon a little bit that uh, you can start doing reinforcement on really at the level four only. Wow. So yeah. uh, that's, that's really, that? yeah. Uh, so. Um... I didn't put those nuances in sort of this. Uh, I said very, very generically, hundreds of models, or so likely, yes, you're looking at more advanced sort of situations there. Um, I know a client has started on um, a tree based approach with some a recommender system. Now they're moving to LCMs. So it's all sort of an evolution. They've gotten enough mileage that they, they could take on on the traditional route. Now they're looking to tweak that even further they want to go to you know deep learning sort of networks like each and each basically it's 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 pretty cool every single sort of product has its own model associated with it and then you know for the recommender system it's basically interrogating all of them to see which ones are going to be the most relevant and then it comes up with a so the software is also involved so it's there, there there's a lot of sort of things that you know you're going to be getting into and we're just sort of scratching the surface with you know, enabling it more advanced ML. And it's also in bringing these things together in a more cohesive sort of solution. We don't do AI right now. No one does, right? We say we do, but, but no, we don't. But but in order to do AI, you sort of need to take, we're great pattern, direct pattern matchers, right? That's us. We can do that. Well, you can train an algorithm to do pattern matching, but we apply them in series, sometimes in parallel. And we sort of match patterns and then take knowledge and then go to the next pattern match. Like if I see a tiger in front of me, I pattern match that as being dangerous to me. But then the next thing I want to do is like, I got to get away. Um, I look back and I see uh, a, pit, a tar pit, I see quicksand, I see a, you know, a burning forest, and then I see a van. You know, I'm going to go for the van. I know this. I, I pattern matched it. But, and so when you think about stacking these things together, the algorithms we have now are almost single use in a way right but sort of think about purposing them in, in sequence or even in parallel that's going to require ml ops that's going to require a lot more sophistication it's going to be a software enabled type of activity yep. oh, no. okay. quick follow-up on the same thing that uh i i got your point about different types of models my, my question was more of the the overall pipeline that we saw yeah. uh, what would it take or is it already uh, agnostic to the type of model or type of machine learning that uh, this one is very agnostic. I did not I intentionally did not okay. put in uh, deep learning or any like you can think of this as 
an experimental space to do GPU or CNN or whatever, vision detection. Yeah. Um, and as far as like when you do that, I mean, you're going to let the use case sort of drive that. And that, that still goes back to the initial planning phase. Like how complicated is this problem? Do we have the capability of doing that ourselves? Do we have the steps? Um, is it that we just consider buying something? Cool, cool, very cool. Thanks, everybody. Okay, thank you so much. Let's give Kevin a round of applause.